Thank you for joining me in this session today on wedge modeling and waveform classification for sub-resolution thickness estimation in the Marcellus. My name is Dennis Ellison. I'm a solutions consultant for Aspen Tech Subsurface Science and Engineering, formerly known as Paradigm. This is the agenda that I'll be using for today. Primarily, I'll be giving an overview of the geology and the depositional setting and environment of the Marcellus Basin, and using that to jump into why and how the wedge modeling was able to give us insights and details into the things that we're able to extract from the seismic and the constraints that we have. Then this integrated into the waveform analysis that we did for with waveform classification, and then I'll finish with the conclusions from this work. So the Marcellus play was deposited in the Middle Devonian. The low density organic shale, the Marcellus shale, is the primary target in this basin. It's currently developed in the northeastern US in Ohio, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and New York. The depth ranges between three to 9,000 feet or one to 3,000 meters, and the thickness in most of this area is between 15 and 250 feet. You know, the Marcellus itself has is below the Montango Formation and above the Selins Grove Limestone. And within the Marcellus, it can be separated further. There's the Oakta Creek, and then that can be grouped out into the upper and lower Oakta Creek members. Now, even within the lower Oakta Creek, one of the target formation that we'll have in the focus of this work is going to be what I will refer to as the Basal Oakta Creek. And this lies below the lower Oakta Creek Formation and above the Cherry Valley uh, Limestone. So Marcellus Play is the largest shale gas producing region in the US, even larger than the Permian Basin. There's a number of controlling factors on the success of the wells in this region though. The depth, thickness, TOC, porosity, permeability, and a number of other things come into play here. But one of the most critical things that determine the effectiveness of the hydraulic stimulation is the thickness of the carbonates above and below the shale layers that are being fracked. The thicker the carbonates, generally the greater the stress barrier and the lar and the negatively impacting that will negative in negatively impact the uh, fracture growth uh, from hydraulic stimulation so the challenge is in there is trying to identify these carbon formations there's the lower oakta creek uh, it thins to the northwest and the cherry valley is relatively constant in that direction and then the into the southwest this is where the Cherry Valley thins, but then the Lower Octa Creek is relatively constant in, in this section here. So trying to identify these different layers here can be a great challenge as they vary in the directions that they're thinning or thickening. And thinner is better for exploding these resources here. Uh, so as a schematic on the right, we have the two carbonate layers uh, of the Lower Octa Creek and the Cherry Valley that's bounding this basal Octa Creek for uh, shale interval that is trying to be produced. Now you can see a number of things here with the uh, synthetic seismic. This is a statistical wavelet that's extracted and convolved with a reflectivity from the impedance logs. And we can see that there's, we're right at tuning thickness already. And this is an example from well eight. And so one of the thicker regions, uh, we're already pushing the limits of separability here. And, but we want to identify all the information that we can to be able to understand and assess the value that we're getting from the seismic. So what can the seismic image, what are the limits of this, and where are these limits as well? And this information can be most meaningful when determining optimal landing targets for the wells. Here's a well correlation across the northern traverse from wells one, two, and eight. And we can see here how the lower walk to creek a member thins greatly to the northwest, but the Cherry Valley formation thins only a small amount, and the Basal Arctic Creek, the shale interval, is relatively constant in this region here. So the primary objective of this is the mapping out the lower Oakta Creek interval and as it pinches out. What can we see with the seismic? What are the resolution limits, the tuning thickness, limit of separability, and where? <laughs> 
So the isochore map on the right hand side is a map from the well markers and it's between the lower and basal Oahuata Creek interval. Now we can see that with how this is thinning, we're going to have a lot of challenges with seismic data. Now on the bottom left, we have an I have an image from Alistair Brown's textbook in 3D Seismic Interpretation. And here is a schematic that he drew that illustrates the impact of, of thin beds and the impact on seismic data and why we can't image below the tuning thickness of seismic and what the limit of visibility is and the limit of separate, separability. Now for this work, we also did this wedge modeling because we want to see this impact specifically on the data ourselves. And so we extracted this wavelet as about 16 uh, milliseconds. And so this in the, in the time sense, this gives us a limit of separability of eight milliseconds and a limit of visibility of four. This is an extracted wavelet with a dominant fre frequency of about 50 Hertz. And so we can see the layers and the intervals um, on, on this well on the left hand side and the challenges that we're going to have as these layers thin. Here's a schematic of the wedge model that was used to do this analysis. We, we have the lower Oaxaca Creek member, the high impedance layer, surrounded by two low impedance uh, geologies. So if we convolve a wavelet with the extracted wavelet with each of these positions, we're able to get an estimate at the relative thickness, which is across the top, and the temporal thickness that we have here with this wedge. So knowing that this is the top of the wedge, that we would want to image, we can take this as the seismic amplitude of across here and we can map out across and we can create a amplitude map or a tuning thickness chart to see what the amplitudes of the seismic are at the each thickness of this wedge model. And what we come across here is that roughly at 50 hertz is where we're maxing out in the constructive interference and then we're starting to destructively interfere uh, with the wavelets, uh, side lobes, and peak, which is causing the average amplitude. So the initial constructive interference causes the amplitude to increase, and then now it starts to destructively interfere, and we're losing this information across here, um, across the top of that wedge interval. Now, in addition to this, uh, we're also limited in the thickness that we're able to image across here. So if we're going to take any of our seismic amplitude picking algorithms, what will happen here is that we'll continue to pick the peaks and troughs, but we won't be able to identify the amplitude variation associated with this if that's a change in geology or if that's simply a, a thinning of the geology across here. Now with this map, we're getting a limit of separability of 50 feet, which means that the limit of visibility is 25 feet. So we cannot reliably ascertain information strictly from the seismic amplitudes alone about the geology. We have to take other approaches. So this introduces the waveform analysis. Now waveform based analysis started many years ago with Conan networks or self-organizing maps, and they're developed as a data uh, data reduction method. And so there, you have the opportunity to use many different attributes with these, or you can use a single attribute. Often these are used in an unsupervised sense where we're relying on the data to distribute itself and to balance itself in the variability that it sees and to create uh, different classifications based on that diversification. Uh, but there's also many supervised approach where you can use specific well locations to guide us into what the geology is. Um, but in, as in, in this case that I'll demonstrate, we can also use either a 2D geometric wedge or a 2D geometry or, or a wedge model to use as the seeds or the inputs for the classification and then have those as the controlling factors for the classification to help us understand what parts of the seismic signal in this interval best correlate to the amplitude that we're seeing. Now waveform training methods, this sort of self-organizing map, it's a competitive learning process. Each node is dependent on its neighboring nodes and the closer the neighbor is, the more competitive they will be with each other. So in self-organizing maps, we have this data space, which is in purple here with the training data, and we want to fit the measure data or the seismic or the mesh here 
to that data space and be able to map it out. At a node at a time, it goes through and it selects a data point within the data space and then a node uh, from the training space and then a node from the data space, and then it pulls it until there's alignment. And we can see in the second image that it's pulling the adjacent data as well. And then this happens recursively with every data point uh, from the seismic or the, or the grid data here until it fills the training data. In a animated schematic, uh, this is what it would look like if we had three different clusters and then tried to fit this grid of data to those clusters. And so these are these data points are linked and tied to each other. The ones that are closest to us are easily classified. The data points that are related to each other but want to be classified as different facies start to compete with each other. And so the reliability of these data points become less, even though they will end up being classified as one or the other. And though this makes sense, especially in areas of transition, where we're going to have unreliable values at the boundaries of different phases here. And this is how this is going to work with the seismic as well, is that we're going to have a number of predefined uh, representations of seismic signal, and that's going to apply this classification to the seismic to help us understand what the distribution of data is. And then there's a number of metrics that can be used to be able to ascertain the reliability of the data. Looking at this interval section, here is going through the uh, southern traverse from wells three to eight. The area that we're trying to image is this here. And so it's incredibly close together, even with zooming in this much. And we can we can convince ourselves here that there is a little bit more thinning to the left than there is to the right, but not a lot. If we're to compare the seismic interpretation of this with the ISA maps, we don't get as much detail, especially on the thin side. Uh, we're able to reasonably map the, the thicker sides near well eight to the northeast, but to the northwest and to the southwest, we're not doing as good of a job. We're, we're hitting this limit of, of resolution here. We're not seeing anything decreasing to the same degree or gradient as we are with the isochore maps. And this is the limit of uh, separability with the seismic data. And as the content of the seismic data is prohibiting us from imaging what is necessary in the subsurface. So how do we overcome that? Well, one approach was with this waveform classification. So using that wedge that I had before, we created nine different classification schemes from five feet to 45 feet. So each color represents a specific thickness of reservoir. And we did this wedge modeling where we thinned the, the carbonate layer and kept the shale layer constant and created these synthetic models. So we can see with this thicker wedge, we hung this on the base of the basal low Arctic Creek where we had the top of the other carbonate layer. And then we can see the other layer coming through here and starting to pinch out. And this is the wedge model that we have for this interval. And so this wedge model represents the interval lower Oaxa Creek, the carbon above the basal, uh, thinning um, by this degree. And then we can apply this to the seismic data and come up with a classification scheme. Now we see a lot of interesting elements across here. One is that we're actually getting down to 15, 10, and even 5 feet in a lot of measurements here. But we also have some anomalies that we need to investigate and ask ourselves why these aren't working. Uh, two here stick out to me uh, very readily is that the, we have these strong um, contrast between thick and thin uh, re, uh, wedge uh, modeling here between 45 and 5 feet. And then there's other behavior where we seem to have a change in curvature of the, of the thickness of the layer than what we saw before uh, compared to the isopac map. And so what's causing these? Is it something that we can easily detect in the seismic data? Could it be something else? looking at the same traverse again, but then now with this in mind, around wells six and seven is where we had the rapid variation between the thick reservoir to the adjacent reservoir. Now, some of you guys may be looking at this and already be able to tell what's going on here. Now, the one that's a little bit more elusive is why is it that we're getting better information um, across here about what's happening in the reservoir. Now, in this uh, region here, it looks like that we're getting a little bit better data. And so we're able to be a little bit more confident um, in the classification there. But near as well as six and seven, this data is pretty noisy. And 
that's why uh, we're destroying the seismic signal and it's a and the seismic traces are appearing as if it is lower amplitude and not being able to discriminate these values here so it's better represented by f 5 or 10 foot reservoir thickness rather than 40 or 45 So for the conclusions, what we're able to see is that from the waveform analysis is that we have 10, 20, and 30 feet um, interval markers that line up very well with the isopike ma um, isopack maps and that we can get really uh, high accuracy estimates from the seismic data with waveform classification on the thinning side. Now, the other thing that we see is that this isn't just a linear change in the thickness here, is that it stays thicker for longer um, than just a linear interpolation. And then it rapidly thins um, before it gets to well two. So as a representation from each of the maps, we have the isochore in the, in the top, isochron in the center, and then the waveform classification in the bottom. And then a cross-section schematic about what's happening here. So from the wells, we get highly accurate information at, at the well locations, which makes sense. But we have to interpolate between to, to justify what's happening there. Then with the seismic isochron, what we see is that we are getting good spatial distribution and information about what's happening. We can see it's a nonlinear trend in the thinning attribute. But when it gets too thin, we just can't tell what's going on and what's happening beyond these regions but with waveform classification we're getting the best of both worlds we're leveraging information from the well, well data with the wedge modeling and we're able to use the seismic to map out the the non-linear uh, thinning of this formation but then also be able to map out the thinning aspects within this formation as well so going through and doing this we're able to see that the lower octa creek interval thins beyond the seismic uh, limit of visibility in the seismic to the west, especially beyond well two. The tuning thickness for this is about 50 feet, and we're already at that um, on the east side, and we're pushing the limits there. And the limit of visibility is 25 feet. And anything that is contributing to poorer signal to noise or loss of frequency is going to increase the thickness for the limit of visibility as well. And so the but one thing that we can be confident in is that the seismic thinning trend is consistent with the ice core trend maps and tops, and the seismic captures the nonlinear variability in the thinning trend in the subsurface. Thank you for uh, your time and your attention for this presentation. If there are any further questions, feel free to reach out to me at dennis.ellison at aspentech.com. Thank you.